In a dark time, the eye begins to see. I meet my shadow in the deepening shade. I hear my echo in the echoing wood. Yeah, but the unconscious is a very funny thing, says he pontifically. You can take a dive in and you can come up with all kinds of garbage around your neck, or you can bring up something beautiful. I mean, in a, in a sense, it's like nature. I suppose it is nature, an interior nature. I mean, poetry is, is or the use of language is one of the differences between us and the apes. Poetry is language at its most memorable, at its best. For poetry, it's, it's much greater and much wider than most people realize. I think that if poetry can be made accessible to the so-called general reader, if it can be heard, and I've written almost everything I've done uh, to be heard, once that occurs, then uh, there's usually understanding. But I think the barrier has been erected against poetry. Everything sort of militates against the radio, the television, the visual education. We're surrounded by all kinds of shoddy speech, by the cliches of advertising, by the bromides of editorials. To bring up a whole generation trained, as it were, on TV is to abandon part of the body, the ear. I believe very definitely that the Kierkegaardian notion that education begins when the teacher starts learning from the student, when it becomes, you know, a, a real reciprocity. Adolescence is peculiarly an interlude time, a time of being blurred or fuzzy or uncertain about what's going on. I said someplace that so much of adolescence is an ill-defined dying because we are always dying into ourselves uh, and, and then renewing ourselves. That's perhaps as good a definition as any of what I try to do. The waking. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I feel my fate in what I cannot fear. I learn by going or I have to go. We think by feeling. What is there to know? I hear my being dance from ear to ear. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Of those so close beside me, which are you? God bless the ground. I shall walk softly there and learn by going where I have to go. Light takes the tree, but who can tell us how? The lowly worm climbs up a winding stair. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Great nature has another thing to do to you and me. So take the lively air and, lovely, learn by going where to go. This shaking keeps me steady. I should know what falls away is always and is near. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I learn by going where I have to go. The actual composition of the poem for me is very rarely a thing that's just dashed off. One begins with a mood of some sort. Then the, the actual writing, the genesis of it, I think usually takes the shape of a line, or one or two or three lines. And these lines may accrete, sort of gather similar lines and images. But it's a bringing together the whole thing into a coherent whole that's hard for me. I mean, that's the ultimate and the final work. Almost invariably, I can tell when the thing is done or in it's, its final form, there may still may be some fiddling or polishing with lines. My papa's waltz. I'd like to think Thomas Hardy is looking down from heaven and approving of this little piece. 
The whiskey on your breath could make a small boy dizzy. But I hung on like death. Such waltzing was not easy. We romped until the pan slid from the kitchen shelf. My mother's countenance could not unfrown itself. The hand that held my wrist was battered on one knuckle. At every step you missed, my right ear scraped a buckle. You beat time on my head with a palm caked hard by dirt, then waltzed me off to bed, still clinging to your shirt. Of course, I put in a few fibs there. My father's palm never was caked hard by dirt, but he simply loved those roses of his and often watered them far into the night. He'd come in in his rubber boots and cold, take himself a little schluck, and then I'd hook my feet over his rubber boots and we'd start uh, dancing to his whistling. Cuttings later. The surge, wrestle, resurrection of dry sticks, cut stems struggling to put down feet. What saints strain so much, rose on such lop limbs to a new life? I can hear underground that sucking and sobbing in my veins. In my bones, I feel it, the small water seeping upward, the tight grains parting at last. When sprouts break out, slippery as fish, I quail, lean to beginning, sheathe wet. The sloth, in moving slow, he has no fear. You ask him something in his ear, he thinks about it for a year. And then, before he says a word, there upside down, unlike a bird, he will assume that you have heard a most exasperating love. But should you call his manner smug, He'll sigh and give his branch a hug. Then off again to sleep he goes, still swaying gently by his toe. And you just know he knows, he knows. Light listens. Oh, what could be more nice than her ways with a man? Kissed me more than twice, once we were left alone. Who'd look when he could feel? She's more size than a seal. Close hair, faintly stirred, light deepened to a bell, the love beat of a bird. She kept her body still and watched the weather flow. We live by what we do. All's known, all all around, the shape of things to be. A green thing loves the green and loves the living ground. The deep shade gathers night. She changed with the changing light. We met to leave again. The time we broke from time. A cold air brought its rain. Singing the stem. She sang a final song. Light listened when she sang. But writing for me is not an easy thing to do. It's always difficult. I always am always I'm terrified sort of with a feeling that, well, you know, feeling after you get something done that's, that you know is really good. But, well, is this the last time? I noticed that Auden said the same thing in his The Making of Poetry. I sometimes try to render the object faithfully, to see it as intensely as I can, to turn that back into language language that doesn't compete necessarily with the painter. The purely imagistic poetry is decidedly limited if it remains nothing more than image, however good. But it's my belief that a thing perceived finally, when one looks so long at the object or has looked at it habitually, or looked at it out of love as Rilke would look at animal in the zoo for hours on end until you become the object and it becomes you. It is an extension of consciousness. It 
seems to me that the, the reading of a good poem is in itself a recreation of the poem. Just as in looking at a picture that it, and that the experience itself is vicarious. That's one of the reasons we have art, isn't it? That is, is that man can experience other men's experiences. To realize that this, this is there, this can happen, or this does happen. Dollar. I have known the inexorable sadness of pencils beneath in their boxes, the dollar of pad and paperweight, all the misery of manila folders and mucilage, desolation in immaculate public places, lonely reception room, lavatory, switchboard, the unalterable pathos of basin and pitcher, ritual of multigraph, paperclip, comma, Endless duplication of lives and objects. And I have seen dust from the walls of institutions, finer than flour, alive, more dangerous than silicon, sift almost invisible through long afternoons of tedium, dropping a fine film on nails and delicate eyebrows, glazing the pale hair, the duplicate, gray, standard faces. I think the very good teaching is like the dance. It's so related to a particular time and a place, and in a sense, it can't be recaptured. I mean, you know, astral. Elegy for Jane, my student, thrown by a horse. I remember the neck curl, limp and damp as tendril, and her quick look, a sidelong pickerel smile. And how one startled into talk, the light syllables leap far, and she balanced in the delight of her thought, a wren, happy, pale into the wind, her song trembling the twigs and small branches. The shades sang with her, the leaves, their whispers turned to kissing, and the moles sang in the bleach valley under the road. Oh, and she was sad, she cast herself down into such a pure depth, even her father could not find her, scraping her cheek against straw, stirring the clearest water. My sparrow, you are not here, waiting like a fern, making a spiny shadow. The sides of wet stones cannot console me, nor the moss, wronged with the last light. If only I could nudge you from this sleep, my maimed darling, my skittery pigeon. Over this damp grave, I speak the words of my love. I, with no right in this matter, neither father nor lover. Now a piece in all humility about one of the great dead. A rouse for Wallace Stevens, the setting of the young poet's saloon. Wallace Stevens, what's he done? He can play the flitter flag. He can see the second sun spinning to the lordly cloud. He's imagination's prince. He can fleet the skitter bomb. How he rolls a vocable, brings a secret right in here. Wallace, Wallace, who is there? Never met him, Dutchman, dear. If I ate and drank like him, I would be a Chanticleer. Speak it from the face out clearly. Here's a mensch but does sing dandy. Eris Nemo's Alski Poopin, Altus Wunterkin. Rorum, horum, cockalorum, the muses they must all adore him. Wallace Stevens, I wait for him. Brother, he's our father. There was a period when many poets were basing poems upon an epigraph. You know, the quotation from the Greek, that sort of thing. I finally found something at my level in the sixth grade natural history book. It went, most mammals like caresses in the sense in which we usually take the word, whereas other creatures, even tame snakes, prefer giving to receiving it. The pensive knew 
the staid art bar, except caresses in the dark. The bear, equipped with paw and snout, would rather take than dish it out. And snakes, both poisonous and garter, in love are never known to bark. But you, my dearest, have a soul encompassing fish, flesh, and fowl. When amorous arts we would pursue, you can with pleasure fill or coup. You are in truth one in a million, at once mammalian and reptilian. A poet should show as many sides of his nature as he can in all decency reveal. And that includes the epigram, the aphorism, the joke, the song, a song-like poem, up to the very highly formalized lyric. It's there, perhaps, that I come closest to old W.B. Gates. Uh, but I, I think I, I do a different thing technically. I end stop the lines much more than he ever did. In other words, I'm using a style that was more current, and the language was perhaps a little less sophisticated in the 16th century in an effort to write a, a, a plain bear. It's an even terrible statement. Whether one does it, of course, all oh, depends on the breed. In the adamant, I had a kind of piece of luck. I fell into its form, which is three, three beat lines, and then a two beat line each time. Originally, they were all three beat lines, but by cutting adjectives in the first and second stanza and changing the wording in the last stanza, I came up with this curious cut-off effect, which in a way uh, suggests maybe the action of a rock crusher. And it, it moved it from a poem, uh, well, it was just a poem, into something that where the rhythm was really inter integral with the feeling. The adamant. Thought does not crush to stone. The great sledge drops in vain. Truth never is undone, its shafts remain. The teeth of knitted gears turn slowly through the night, but the true substance bears the hammer's weight. Compression cannot break a center so congealed. The tool can chip no plate, the core lies sealed. Gob music is the music that the old fellers make and the young ones in Western Ireland when there's neither fiddle nor squeeze box for the dancing. And it's a strange and almost Arabic thing at times. The refrain here attempts to approximate that kind of music. And it's a tribute to three pub singers in Innisbuff in Ireland. I do not have a fiddle, so I get myself a stick. And then I beat upon a can or pound upon a brick. And if the meter needs a change, I give the cat the kick. <coughs> Whenever I feel it coming on, I need a morning drink. I get a stool and sit and stare at the slop here by the sink. I lean my head near the brim and edge and do not mind the stink. Oh, the slop here is the place to think in the perils of too early drink. Too early drink, too early drink, and bring a liquid man down. I went fishing with the pin in the dark of an old spittoon. Me handkerchief had fallen in with more than half a crown. I stared into the dented hole, and what do you think I saw? A color pure, pure as gold, a color without flaw. A color without flaw, 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 a color without flaw. I stared and stared, and what do you think? Me thirst came on, and I had to drink. Indeed, I saw a shimmering lake of slime and shine and spit. And I kneeled down and did partake a bit of the likes of it. And it reminded me, but oh, I'll keep my big mouth shut. It happened, though, in Buffin Town, the color of my dears was Guinness brown, but it had a flavor all its own as I gulped it down, as I gulped it down. There, I'm in ease, a man of renown, I did partake a bit. Oh, the slop pale is the place to think in the perils of the poor lady. Too early drink, too early drink, will bring a good man down. And one of these pub boys said, and be God if you weren't reading it out of the book like the priest himself. 
Well, there's another aspect. The poet, presumably, an is in the foreground of consciousness. He is aware of things, in a sense, before they happen or before they generally happen. He is the one to whom the zeitgeist is most apparent. I mean, a, a public poet like Auden, when he says, we must love one another or die, he said it in a very few words, the very central thing in our civilization. The best modern poetry is characterized by a kind of terrible honesty of imagination. This is one of the things that we inherit from Blake. Poetry makes, in a sense, a profound and terrible demand says, change your life. And I think that that's why the general public backs away from poets like Bogan or Hunitz. They don't want their lives changed. They don't want to enter some other consciousness. They are, in a sense, they're unconsciously or consciously afraid. Some of these pieces begin in the mire, as if man were a shape writhing from the old rock. This may be due in part to the Michigan from which I came. The marsh, the mire, the void is always there, immediate and terrifying. It's a splendid place for schooling the spirit. It's America. Nonetheless, in spite of all the muck and welter, the dark, the dreck of these poems, I still count myself a happy poet. I proclaim once more a condition of joy. In a dark time, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. I meet my shadow in the deepening shade. I hear my echo in the echoing wood. A lord of nature weeping to a tree. I live between the heron and the wren, beasts of the hill and serpents of the den. What's madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? The day is on fire. I know the purity of pure despair. My shadow pinned against a sweating wall. That place among the rocks, is it a cave or winding path? The edge is what I have. A steady storm of correspondences, a night flowing with birds, a ragged moon, and in broad day, the midnight come again. A man goes far to find out what he is, death of the self, in a long, tearless night, all natural shapes, blazing, unnatural light. Dark, dark my life, and darker my desire. My soul, like some heat-maddened summer fly, keeps buzzing at the sill. Which I, his I, a fallen man, I climb out of my fear. The mind enters itself, and God the mind. And one is one, free in the tearing wind. Maybe the kind of knowing that occurs in poetry is related, at least, uh, to Satori. It was the Zen notion that a sitting still, which goes beyond a mere quietism. I believe that one can suddenly become aware of another consciousness, a consciousness other than the immediate, a consciousness that is higher. I am most immoderately married. The Lord God has taken my heaviness away. I have merged like the bird with the bright air, and my thought flies to the place by the bow tree. Being, not doing, is my first joy. I feel that poetry, finally, is a joyous thing. Hence, once more the round. What's greater, pebble or pond? What can be known, the unknown? My true self runs toward a hill, more, oh, more visible. Now I adore my life with a bird, the abiding leaf, with a fish, the questing snail, and the eye altering all. And I dance with William Blake, 
for love, for love's sake. And everything comes to one as we dance on, dance on, dance on. <laughs> 